Welcome to Deepening Your Faith. I am Pastor Daniel, and I am uh, actually really excited about today. I've been looking forward to today with Dr. Fred Sanders. And so uh, before I do introductions, would you please join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all the many blessings that you give us. We thank you for who you are, that you're a good and holy and sovereign and righteous God. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the salvation that he provides. We thank you for your spirit, God, who empowers us and enables us to live for you. And we thank you for people like Dr. Sanders, for their ability to make complex ideas easy to understand. We thank you for our church, that we have an opportunity today to meet together as one body and to, to worship you and to learn about you and to grow in Christ-likeness. And so we ask all these things in your son's holy and precious name. We all pray together and said, amen. Well, again, I'm Pastor Daniel, and this is Deepening Your Faith. It's a four-week series, uh, and if you complete the whole year's worth of Deepening Your Faith, all four quarters, at the end of the uh, time, you uh, get a certificate. Um, just as a way of showing that you did a lot of hard work. You even wrote a paper. For those of you doing the certificate, there's a paper at the end. So it shows that you put a lot of work and grew in knowledge, and hopefully that knowledge actually uh, transforms into Christ-likeness. And uh, I want to introduce to you uh, Dr. Fred Sanders. He is the author of, well, the editor of Jesus and Trinitarian Perspective. He is also the author of our required reading for this quarter of Deepening Your Faith, The Deep Things of God, uh, How the Trinity Changes Everything, and then a brand new biography on John Wesley called Wesley and the Christian Life, The Heart Renewed in Love. Um, so, and those books are actually available outside The Deep Things of God and Dr. Sanders' new book on Wesley, and they're signed? And so they're signed, so that's a kind of a cool bonus. And so I encourage you to get those outside after class. They are $15 a piece. The signature is free. And uh, with no further ado, would you please welcome Dr. Fred Sanders. It was on mute. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. This is my favorite topic to talk about, which um, sometimes strikes audiences kind of strange because it's one thing to love Jesus or to love God or to be passionate about certain things from Scripture, but to say that you love the Trinity can still kind of sound odd. So um, I'm here to talk to you about heresies concerning the Trinity in keeping with the uh, theme of this series, Deepening Your Faith. Um, but I'm going to start pretty far back because I want to uh, kind of I want to try to warm your hearts towards the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, my heart is warm towards the doctrine of the Trinity, partly because I sort of made it up on my own. I invented this doctrine. Um, now, that was because I was raised in a, uh, a little church, actually here in Southern California, where we talked about Jesus. It was a Pentecostal church, so we talked a lot about the Holy Spirit, and we were pretty familiar with God the Father. But nobody ever kind of put the whole package together for me theologically. So um, when I really made my faith my own as a teenager, uh, I was reading the Bible. I was reading Ephesians 1, the first chapter of Ephesians, actually. And as the more I read it, the more I studied it and thought about it, the more I thought, this only works if somehow the one God is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And as soon as I thought that thought, it, I thought, oh, no, now I have to go start a cult or something because I've never heard anyone say it that way. <laughs> and I, I, didn't, I just wanted to be a normal good Christian. I didn't want to be a cult leader. And I'm, you know, I'm not charismatic enough to be a cult leader. So how's this going to work out? Well, then I started reading around and I realized, no, 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 lots of people believe in the Trinity. In fact, all Christians believe in the Trinity. This is sort of a, we weren't exactly keeping it a secret at my church, but what we weren't doing is kind of going to the next level and putting the whole theological package together in such a way that kids growing up in the church could recognize, oh, that's an organizing way of coming to terms with a lot of information about the Trinity. So um, I have the joy of having invented the doctrine myself and of having it be something deeply traditional, right? So I get the best of both worlds there. I have pride of ownership, but I didn't have to start a cult. Uh, so um, I want to start by focusing in on just the term the Trinity and look at it for a second. Um, there's a saying that you hear all the time about the Trinity, try to understand it and you'll lose your mind. Try to deny it and you'll lose your soul. 
Have you heard this? This is quoted all the time in um, textbooks on the Trinity or systematic theology books. And um, used to be, I'd find it in, in dozens and dozens of books, but it always said, as someone has said, and then there was no footnote. It wouldn't tell you who had said this. So it's one of those things, everyone quotes it, but no one tells you where they got it from. Um, I actually don't like this saying very much because it really seems to me to kind of slam a door, right? And say, oh, you want to think about the Trinity? Well, on the upside, you might go crazy. And on the downside, you might go to hell. So what do you think, guys? Let's talk about the Trinity, right? It's not exactly a warm and welcoming, you know, the, the, the upside's not that great. It's really a kind of a warning, right? Like, you'd better not try to understand this thing or your head will explode. But you must affirm it even though you don't understand it, or else your soul's in jeopardy. I just, every time I hear that, I think, is this part of a sales pitch? Is, is this like trying to convince people to think about the Trinity? What I want to do, we'll talk about some of the truth of this statement. I actually think if you reverse it a little bit, it, it might be more inviting. And I want to present the doctrine of the Trinity in a way that's inviting. Um, if you say something like, it's really essential, it's actually been widely recognized in the Christian church as an important thing that you need to affirm, um, and yet there are limits to the amount of understanding you can have of it, right? If you just start with a don't deny it, but don't expect to totally understand it. Now, I'll just say right up front, we're not going to totally comprehensively grasp everything there is uh, about the Trinity. Um, we are going to understand everything about it that can be understood. There's a significant chunk of information here that God has revealed to us that is knowable, and we're going to go there. But at the beginning of a talk, I want to kind of lower expectations a little bit and say, we're not going to leave here with absolutely crystal clear comprehension of the triune God himself. We'll have a good, clear understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity, what it does make known, what God has made known, what the church has recognized in putting the doctrine together this way, um, and I hope incentive to go on learning about it even more. Yeah. So um, I actually, I saw the thing quoted so much, I had to chase it down and figure out who first said it, and I got as far back as 1700 this guy named Robert South, who's kind of a clever guy, so I'm guessing he made it up because he's, he's sort of witty in the way he writes his sermons. He's a British clergyman. Um, start in this sentence, the Trinity, third line down, the Trinity is a fundamental article of the Christian religion. And as he that denies it may lose his soul, so he that too much strives to understand it may lose his wits. Now notice it's a little friendlier the way he puts it, right? If you deny it, it's an essential doctrine. So you're, you're in danger here. You're crossing the line into heresy if you deny the doctrine. But he that too much strives to understand it may lose his wits, right? It's not you can't understand it at all. It's that there's a limit and you shouldn't try too much, right? By definition, too much is too much. Uh, he goes on to say, knowledge is nice. This is about 1700. Nice back then didn't mean polite. It meant intricate or um, a careful distinction. Yeah. Knowledge is nice, intricate, and tedious, but faith is easy, and what is more, it is safe. So 1700, they made their S's look like F's, right? Uh, it is safe. And why should I then unhinge my brains, ruin my mind, and pursue distraction in the disquisition of that which a little study would sufficiently convince me to be not intelligible? So here he's kind of making fun of the view that would say, why bother studying it? I think it's weird that the, the line is often quoted a little bit backwards and incredibly demotivatingly. So let's go a little further into the doctrine of the Trinity and try to present it as a welcome mat, not as a slammed door to keep you from understanding, but as a welcoming doctrine. Because Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Why? For obedience, for the Christian life, that we may do all the words of this law. Notice, the secret things belong to the Lord, and so if you came here to get secret mysteries that God has not revealed, but a clever theologian was brought in to peek behind the back of God and let you know what things are really like back there, that's not going to happen, right? Um, God has secrets. He's not telling us. I don't know them. You don't know them. You shouldn't believe anyone who claims to know them. He's just got secrets. You want to know one of them? Sorry, I can't tell you, right? He, they, they belong to Him. Um, he may let us know them later on. Sometimes I think that in heaven, every millennium or so, he'll tell us another secret. We'll say, wow, this is great. But I don't know that. I just made it up. So um, notice the secret things belong to the Lord, but everything he has revealed, anything he has revealed, that's ours. And what are we supposed to do with it? Well, it's revelation. It's something he has made known. So he has revealed things to us in order for us to know them, right? He's a good revealer. He's a competent explainer. 
And when he makes something known about himself, it's really ours. We can write it down. We can teach our kids. We can actually embrace it with our minds and have the appropriate amount of understanding of it. And that's what the doctrine of the Trinity is. It's knowledge about God that we're going to hold on to and teach faithfully. Not for its own sake. God's not in the business of satisfying our curiosity. Um, you get the purpose statement here in Deuteronomy 29:29, 29, 29, that we may do all the words of this law, right? So we can know him better, so we can love him more, so we can serve him better. That's what the doctrine of the Trinity is for. Now, we're also going to focus in on heresies. Uh, I had a kind of a font collision here at the last minute with this uh, prezi that I put together, but um, so you're supposed to be able to see the whole word heresies there. Yeah. Uh, here's a definition of heresies. This kind of uh, will help us get our bearings as we start in today, but also for your whole four-week series as you're looking at the nature of heresy and using it as a way to deepen your faith. A heresy is a theological error that denies or distorts a central Christian doctrine, harms its adherents spiritually, and continues to be held even after credible warnings. Now, since you'll be on heresies for four weeks, I want to spend a little bit of time taking this definition apart um, before we launch into the Trinity. So a heresy is a theological error that does these three things. Um, this is my own definition, just kind of culled together from discussions that I've seen of heresies, including the one in the book that you're using by uh, Justo Gonzalez. Um, notice that it's a kind of theological error that does three things, and that means there are lots of theological errors, and not all of them are heresies. You ever think about that? You can make lots of theological mistakes all the time. Some of them are heresies. Some of them deny or distort central Christian truths, do harm to the soul of the listener or the, learn, the person affirming it, and uh, you've been warned against and ought to know better. But there are other theological errors that are just wrong. Now, you might say, we always want to be right all the time, so what's the distinction you're making here? Well, I mean, it kind of matters. A heresy is worse, you know? All theological errors are bad, but they're not all bad, bad. Have you ever believed something wrong and then received teaching and said, oh, I was wrong about that? Huh, who knew? I guess it's better to be right than wrong. Um, I teach at Biola University uh, in the undergraduate curriculum. I teach college students. And a lot of times they show up from good churches and good families, but I begin teaching doctrine and I teach Socratically, so I'm not just saying true things from the front, but drawing it out of them with questions. And that kind of brings their state of knowledge with it and weird things come out of the state of knowledge of 18-year-old young Christian people. Um, so I'll say something about, you know, um, when did Jesus end his incarnation? It's a trick question because he didn't, but students will say, I think at the ascension, yeah, he probably, uh, yeah, he, like he came down and became human, but then at the ascension he probably stopped. I'll say, that's interesting. Where did he put his human nature? So, yeah, I don't know. He rose up into heaven, so he must have left it like on the dark side of the moon or something. Hmm. So you're going to pick it up again when he returns? Yeah, probably. I haven't thought about it much. And so what I always say is like, that, like, close the door right now. That's a terrible theological error. Like that is, the incarnation is permanent. The Son of God wasn't always human. He always existed in the form of God, but he really took to himself human nature permanently. It's an ongoing incarnation. He is permanently bound to us, and we are permanently, securely joined to him. And a lot of times students have this weird moment where they say, that can't be true because I've never thought it before. Right? I'll say, no, it actually is true. Like, ask lots of Christians you know, and most of them already believe this. Some of them don't. You can trip them up. Um, but notice, I exposed an error. I did say shut the door so nobody got really nervous because we say crazy things, you know, when we talk to each other about doctrine. Um, but one of my colleagues that teaches at Biola always tells students, no, it's okay. You're going to make some mistakes as you try, as your faith seeks understanding. You're going to make some errors. Um, but when you're just starting into studying a doctrine, sitting down and thinking about it, even if you've grown up with the doctrine, if you're doing your first round of thinking about it, you're going to make some mistakes. And what my colleague at Biola says is, you don't know enough yet to be a heretic, right? Like you're just trying ideas out and you've got to try ideas out. That's proof that you're thinking about it. So you do want to be corrected. Of course, you always want the right answer. Um, but, you know, things being what they are, you're not always going to get the right answer. So uh, this is just a way of saying, we're going to talk about heresies. They're really bad. Avoid them at all costs. Theological errors, you should also avoid and seek to correct and get good teaching, but you don't have to be phobic about every theological error. Does that make sense? So, certain kind of theological error is a heresy. What kind? Well, a kind that denies or distorts a central doctrine. 
Um, 1 John 2 puts it in terms of denying, right? It says three times there in 1 John 2, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. So a lot of times, Christian, um, Christian revelation is what it is, and for people to look at it and say, I do not accept that part of it, that's kind of a textbook case of heresy, to say, I know that that's revealed, I don't accept that part of it. It's a denial. Um, the word heresy, the root of it, comes from a Greek word having to do with picking and choosing or selecting. So a lot of times heresy involves denying or suppressing or refusing to accept something that's been revealed. But also distorting it badly enough that you don't recognize it anymore. We'll talk about this a lot when I'm back in two weeks to do Christology. Um, there, it's really clear that there are people who don't deny Jesus Christ, but their teaching about Jesus Christ is so messed up that they functionally are not identifying Jesus anymore rightly. You know what I mean? I was talking to a guy one time um, who said, oh, you're into Jesus? I'm into Jesus too. I said, really? Tell me about that. And he said, yeah, Jesus is a space alien, and he was here once. Then we treated him bad, so he flew away. And I'm thinking, I, I think you're thinking E.T., right? <laughs> um, um, but he had this, he'd thought about this a lot, and he said, no, no, Jesus left here, and he's on this great tour of the universe. He's visiting all the planets, and when he comes back, that's the second coming. And I thought, okay, we got a problem here. You're saying Jesus, but you don't mean Jesus, right? So just because you're using the word or the name doesn't mean you're rightly identifying him. That's a wild story you've got, and it picks out a different character. So a denial or a distortion of a central Christian doctrine. Um, obviously, if we were going to make a circle and put all the central Christian doctrines in it and then talk about which ones are peripheral rather than central, we could have some good fights about what belongs to the middle and what belongs on the margins, right? Because one of the main things Christians disagree about is what it's okay to disagree about, which is a whole other level of disagreement, right? But um, if you just blur your eyes at it a little bit, it's pretty easy to see which things go right in the middle. Um, and I would say that the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the nature of salvation, and the character of the God who sends Jesus and brings about this salvation, those belong in the middle, and then we could get to details of the other things later. And then the third thing, or the second thing here, it harms its adherents spiritually. So it's possible to have wrong ideas and wrong commitments to all sorts of doctrines, but you can tell it's the middle ones that cause kind of a domino effect in your mind and start knocking down all the other doctrines. Um, so there are some things that to misbelieve or disbelieve them actually hurts you, actually is a barrier to communion with God. That's the whole reason we do theology. It's not just to get A's on the test. We do theology so that we can know God better, so we can love God better, right? It takes knowledge of someone to have real, informed, committed love of them. You can't love a person in the abstract, right? If you actually have interpersonal love for someone, it's based on what you know about them. God's the same way. So there are some things that's so important to know and get right about God, if you get them wrong, it hinders your relationship in multiple ways. And then the third thing, it continues to be held even after credible warnings. So if you have been told by older and wiser Christians, many of them dead, that this is a bad idea, uh, and yet you keep saying, I'm pretty sure I know better than um, Jonathan Edwards, John Calvin, Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, you name it. I think I've got things figured out better than them because I did a little Bible study yesterday. It took about a half hour, <laughs> right? Um, so it doesn't mean you have to accept whatever the Christian tradition hands down to you, but if everyone you meet who is older and further along in studying the faith tells you that's a mistake, you'll want to leave that there, yeah? Then you probably want to listen to that. So there's an element of arrogance and um, obstinacy connected to heresy, right? Um, there's an unteachability about it. Now, all of these we could nuance in lots of ways and talk about how um, critical thinking requires, you know, careful thinking and weighing evidence and things like that. We could say all of that, but these are the marks of heresy. Um, yeah, so let me just say one other thing before we launch into a, a four-week series on heresies. It's probably best <laughs> not to accuse other people of heresy unless you've got a really good uh, uh, idea that you're right about that. Um, and that would include that they have been warned several times. So your initial warning shouldn't be something like, heretic. And again, I, I say this partly because I deal with um, eager young 18 to 21 year olds, right? And they, um, when they learn the word heresy and how the word heresy applies, they're eager to use it. You know what they say? I give a boy a hammer and the whole world looks like a nail. Yeah? So um, you get a lot of self-appointed hammers of the heretics out there who just decide, 
uh, as soon as I find somebody who's wrong, I am going to let them know they're a heretic, which is really terrifying at a Christian university because, you know, you send them all home for Christmas, and like they go to their home churches and say, my professor said you're a heretic. I say, no, that's not how that worked at all. You should, anyway. Um, one last thing about heresies. If someone has a view that is wrong, that seems wrong to you, and it seems to you that that's going to lead to trouble, you can warn them that their idea is wrong and it will lead to trouble, like your idea is wrong, and it would lead you to heresy if you followed it out consistently. But that's very different from saying, you now affirm a heresy, right? If someone's a little bit wrong about the deity of Jesus, uh, they're not totally wrong. They still think Jesus is God, but they, 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 they say that a little bit wrong. I don't say, that's a heresy. I say, I think that's an error, and you're going to want to be careful, because if you were consistent with it, and if the other safeguards built into your belief in Christ didn't kick in, that would lead to heresy. It's one thing to point out that the road goes there, but don't pretend they're already there, yeah? We often cut off conversation where we could actually convert someone's views and actually lead them further more securely into the truth because um, it's kind of interesting to see how this view could lead to this and to go ahead and tell them that they were already there, but they're not already there. If they were already there, you'd have to combat them in a different way. Thank God they're not there yet. Try to draw them back in, yeah, yeah. Okay, so much for heresy. Uh, there, I just dismissed it. Let's, um, let's go now into the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, this is a night of faith. Uh, that's just a cool picture. This is a medieval manuscript uh, by a Dominican uh, theologian from the 1200s, or the 1100s, actually. Um, on, on the uh, left are a bunch of vices. So this is a, a, a tabulation of vices and how to be a Christian soldier who uh, pursues virtues and fights all the different vices. So they're all personified over there, sort of monstery looking things kind of coming to get you. And he's got the full armor of God on and he's charging into battle. Um, on the right then what you have is the soldier himself and he's got his weapons and he's got a shield. And it's a pretty cool shield. Um, you can't read it very well, uh, so I'll just give you the English translation. But I think you can see there's one thing in the middle and three things around the side. It's the shield of the Trinity. Um, the phrase in Ephesians, take up the shield of faith, um, in medieval iconography, when people drew the shield of faith, they thought, well, how do you draw the shield of faith? And they decided, let's put the Trinity on it. We believe in the Trinity, so let's have the shield of faith be belief in the right God and the doctrine of the Trinity. So here's the English translation. Um, God is in the middle, Father, Son, and Spirit around the outside. I'll come back to that in a second, but you see how that's, it's there in Latin, it's just Deus in the middle, Pater, Filius, and Spiritus Sanctus around the outside. Um, and they are connected by these logical statements. Now, this is very cold and abstract. You know, this is not a heartwarming presentation of the doctrine of the Trinity, but we're going to try to get real rational clarity on what's being claimed here. God is in the middle as the essence or the being or the nature of divinity. So, you know, deitas, Godhead, I think the King James Bible will sometimes uh, produce that as. And then you have the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and you have some logical affirmations uh, that you would want to make of these three. The Father is God, right? He's not not God. He's not sub-God or kind of God. He's also not a third of God, right? He is God. He's, he's fully divine. He's God. Um, and then the Son is God and the Spirit is God. So there are three of whom you have to affirm this, let's go ahead and use the word person here for the first time, we'll come back to it later, this person is God. Not a part of God, not a third of God, not God Jr., but God. And then these three stand in relationship to each other. And there are lots of things we could say about the relationship of the Father to the Son, right? We hear all about it in John's Gospel, it's love and sending and obedience and faithfulness. Uh, a lot of things you could say about the relationship of the Son and the Spirit, that the Son gives the Spirit, that the Spirit um, illumines the Son, shines forth from the Son, rests on the Son, radiates from the Son. But in terms of logical necessity, what this diagram boils it all down to, all those rich relationships, is just is not. You see how that kind of gets the bottom line there? Well, if they have a relationship, then they're not each other, right? If the Father has some relationship with the Son, love, whatever it is, then the Father isn't the Son. They're related to each other. Uh, they're in relationship. Um, so, let's see. Say anything else about that? No, it's a cool little diagram. I don't know who first invented it. Um, believe it or not, the Wikipedia entry on the Shield of the Trinity is really good. I don't know who wrote it, but I should send them something. Um, you, you don't always expect to go get good theology from Wikipedia. Um, but this, including the images, are all right there. So, nice stuff. And a really handy diagram. You know, it's not, 
It's not everything you need to embrace fully the biblical warmth of the doctrine of the Trinity, but boy, does it clarify it. Here's what's basically going on. If you've got being in the middle, then what we're talking about is what there's one of in God. Now, to some extent, you can make up any word you want for what there's one of in God. You've just got to affirm, if you're a monotheist, that God is one something, right? Long tradition of saying one being, one entity, one essence, one nature. Uh, kind of doesn't matter what word you use here if you're just trying to be clear about the unity of God and that we are firmly committed to monotheism. There aren't lots of gods. There's one God. And then if you were going to go around the outside and say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and instead of just saying that phrase over and over, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if you wanted to say, so there are three other somethings in God, and they can't be three beings, or you'd have this logical contradiction of God being one being and three beings. That wouldn't make any sense. So there's one of something in God, and there's three of something in God. Now, you can leave the door open there all you want and kind of be open-minded about it. Eventually, you'll probably settle on something like the classic formulation, uh, one being in three persons. This goes all the way back. Probably the first person to say this was Tertullian of Carthage. Um, I don't know, about the year 160. So way, way back, he gets this um, in Latin, uh, una substantia tres personas, one being three persons. Um, and then the Athanasian Creed, which probably dates to the fifth century, um, uses this great phrase, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the being. Can everyone see that? I, the, the font went incredibly skinny on me at the last minute. But um, Neither confusing the persons nor dividing the being. Now, this is a cool kind of thing to memorize and recite and check yourself to see if you're making any mistakes. But um, if you take it apart, right, what would it be to confuse the persons? Well, that would be to deny the is not relationships among them, right? To say, I think the Father is the Son. Well, you're really confusing the persons, aren't you? Um, I, there's an um, anti-Trinitarian uh, movement, uh, Oneness Pentecostalism. We'll talk about it a little bit later. They are firmly committed to the idea that Jesus is God the Father. Um, and I actually like it when they're incredibly clear about it, because sometimes they're confusing, and they can trip you up, and they sound kind of right. But boy, I saw they make t-shirts now that say, Jesus is God the Father. And I think, awesome. Could you get all your people to wear those? Because I think normal biblical Christians see that and say, I don't know much about the Trinity, but I know that can't be right. There's no way Jesus is God the Father, because that's a confounding of the persons, right? Um, that one's pretty obvious. You could also confound or confuse Jesus and the Holy Spirit and think of, you know, when I think about the Holy Spirit, all I think of is sort of Jesus, but vaguer, right? Okay, that's a little bit confusing the persons. You know, you, you kind of need to be able to um, they're not each other. They're in a relationship to each other. One sends the other at Pentecost, yeah? Okay, nor dividing the being, because the other place you could go here is get really clear on Father, Son, and Spirit that they are three persons, and begin talking about them as if there are three beings who are God, three different gods who at some point in, in the uh, time immemorial got together and decided to be a three-god club and act in a unified way. So that would be wrong, right? That would be to take the persons and treat them as if they were natures, right? Or to blow them all together would be to take the persons and treat them as if they were the nature, uh, or tr treat the nature as if it's three persons. Yeah, anyway, you see that? You can kind of memorize this, get a tattoo out if you're that kind of person, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the being. Yeah, you don't want to do that. All right. Um, now, we haven't talked about the Bible yet, and while I love that logical diagram, we really need to take this to the Word of God, because I've asserted a few times something that is time for me to actually demonstrate. So, you know, you're being very nice to me and taking it on good faith that I read the Bible and got this from there. I said Deuteronomy 20, 20, 29, 29, 29, the things God has revealed belong to us, but I didn't yet actually show that God has revealed these, and that's what it all comes down to. It really matters that the doctrine of the Trinity is logically coherent, right? It's it's one thing to say God is a mystery. It's another thing to say, I'm going to make nonsensical statements and contradict myself and then hide behind the fact that God is a mystery. You know, that one thing is totally true. God is unknowable. Uh, yeah, God is incomprehensibly uh, mysterious to us. He's truly made himself known, but one of the things he's truly made known about himself is that he's incomprehensible, right? that you can truly know him by acquaintance, but you can't rationally comprehend him and get your mind around him in any way, and that includes the doctrine of the Trinity. But that doesn't give us as Christians the right to say ridiculous things, like 
you know what? God is a square circle, right? And then when someone says, I don't think that's really an idea, you go, I know, not in your little human mind, but God is a square circle. Well, I, I don't know if God's a square circle or not. I know that it doesn't make any sense to say the phrase square circle, right? Like that's not actually a concept. That, that's not an idea. It's, um, you can take that adjective and put it in front of that noun, but you can't actually, like, go ahead, close your eyes right now and think about a circle that is square. Think about that. You know why you can't? There's no such thing, right? Square excludes circle, so it's logically incoherent. I think we all sort of recognize that eventually, but sometimes as Christians it's tempting to go, I don't know, it's all the Trinity, it's a mystery, right? Well, the, mis- the Trinity is allowed to be a mystery. You're not allowed to say illogical things and give the faith a bad name just because you're incoherent, right? It's very tempting, especially as a theologian, to do that. Like, I'll get a hard question sometimes, I go, I don't know, perhaps it's in the incomprehensibility of God. Like, sometimes that's the right answer. Other times I'm hiding behind God's mystery. God's mystery isn't there for me to hide behind. It's for me to say rational things about that adequately point to, that accurately indicate the revealed incomprehensibility of God. Yeah? So that's important, but it's kind of cold and abstract. It's uh, Because to, to go the other way is to say, well, who cares if it's logically coherent if it's not biblical? Like, why waste our time thinking through this and figuring out if God has not revealed it and made it known, right? Otherwise, I could be spending a lot of mental energy putting together a non-contradictory notion that doesn't adequately correspond to what God is. If, if it's not biblical, who cares if it's logical? It's kind of the short version of that, yeah? So let's see if it's biblical. And by the way, I think uh, I made a little bookmark there that says Doctrine of the Trinity, because we're going to go in there and see how the Doctrine of the Trinity is in the Bible. And it's in there in a very special and I think unique way. So let me show you how that is. We'll have to open the Bible, which yeah, I just did that. Um, here's the thing about the Doctrine of the Trinity. God's triunity is a biblical idea, but because what the Doctrine of the Trinity really is, is it's revealed when God the Father sends the Son and the Holy Spirit for our salvation, right? Um, God the Father sends the Son incarnate and the Holy Spirit poured out, the incarnate Son and the Pentecostal Spirit, to be our salvation, to bring about uh, the redemption promised in the gospel. Um, And that's how we know God is Trinity. But that can't happen in the Old Testament because the Old Testament is the time of promise, right? It's the time when the Messiah is going to come and the Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. Joel 2, 2, in that time, in that day, in that future day, says Joel, uh, the, the Lord will pour out His Spirit on all flesh. So it hasn't happened yet. So the doctrine of the Trinity can't really be revealed yet because it's all promise time. Well, then you get to that. So that would be why you can't find really good, clear statements of the doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament. It's all in the form of promise. It's all looking forward to a revelation that's going to happen when Jesus is born, when the Messiah comes. But then you get to the New Testament and think, great, this is where the doctrine of the Trinity is going to be revealed. But by the time you get to the New Testament, it's the time of fulfillment and the Jesus and the Spirit have already been, right? They've already come and done their thing, and now we're writing documents about it. Gospels telling the story of Jesus, um, epistles to the churches, straightening out doctrine and establishing churches. But in between is where the Father sends the Son and the Spirit. So you get that? I'll say it another way here in a second, but notice that it's kind of a biblical doctrine that's neither in the Old Testament nor in the New Testament, I didn't make this up. I got this from B.B. Warfield, who, a Princeton theologian, wrote this about 100 years ago. It's sort of between the Testaments, and I don't mean the Apocrypha, right? I mean that, like that one blank page between Malachi and Matthew. Like that, um, the documents written to the left of that are in the time of expectation, and the documents written to the right of that are already looking back to when fulfillment happened. Yeah? So in the nature of the sort of documents we have, they're not capturing the reality of Jesus himself standing there. Right? The Gospels are telling you about when he did. Um, another way to put this is this. The documents on the left side of that blank page say the Messiah and the Spirit are coming. The documents to the right say, hey, the Messiah and Spirit already came. Now, <laughs> this is not just a tricky way to say, because it sounded kind of tricky, right? It's a biblical doctrine. It's just not in the Bible. Right? That sounds like sophistry. Um, what I'm saying is the nature of the revelation of the Trinity, it's not about God writing down information and handing it to us. It's about the Son and the Spirit actually showing up in person in history. Like God made this known by doing something and explaining it. 
So the doing something is what's not recorded here. The explanation of it is. So expectation and fulfillment with the Son and the Spirit personally showing up in actual history of God's work right in the middle. Um, that explains so much about how the Trinitarian um, doctrine is contained in Scripture, because it is contained, um, but it's contained as, by looking forward and looking back. And um, I could do a longer version of this, but I, I want to get to a couple of key Bible verses here. And I've thought about studying a Trinity study, by, of, of um, publishing a Trinity study Bible. You know what I mean? Like one that's got little uh, red, circle, or red uh, triangles in it everywhere, connecting the three persons of the Trinity. Because I have a blast. When I'm doing a Bible study and find Father, Son, and Spirit mentioned somewhere, I think, oh, that's great. I've got to do that in. And people look at my Bible and say, how'd you get all those red triangles in there? And I think, maybe I can make some money selling a Trinity study Bible with little red triangles all over it. But I actually want people to do that for themselves and be able to see the work of God as Father, Son, and Spirit all through Scripture. The reason it's great to do it for yourself is, um, since the doctrine of the Trinity is nowhere in Scripture announced and broadcast, as it, no one ever comes out and blows a horn and says, doo, 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 doo. now behold ye the doctrine of the Trinity. It never happens. Everything you read is either coming up to the revelation of the Trinity or looking back on it. And the ones who are looking back on it are saying all kinds of things that only make sense if the Trinity is true, right? Um, so Paul, for instance, in all 13 of Paul's letters, he never sits down and writes a chapter explaining the doctrine of God to you, right? He never sits down and says, now Romans in chapter 19, I will explain to you how we monotheistic Jews also worship Jesus and how that works together logically. At no point does he establish that with a chapter on the doctrine of God. What's Paul do? Well, you know what Paul writes about. He's always writing to churches and putting out fires and establishing doctrine. Um, and so he's saying something like, here's what salvation is. It's when the Father adopts you through sending the spirit of sonship into your hearts to apply the redemption worked out by the Messiah, right? All he had to do was talk about salvation, but the way it comes out only makes sense if he gets the name Father, Son, and Spirit as he describes it. See how he kind of presupposes that everybody already knows about the Trinity? He does this over and over when he talks about discipleship, the foundation of the church. In Romans, Paul can't even say, pray for me, without making it come out Trinitarian, right? He says something about bending your knee before the Father, that in the name of Jesus, he would be strengthened in his spirit. You say, really, Paul? All you had to say was pray for me. But you went and made it Trinitarian. And you went and made it Trinitarian because of the momentous thing that happened in the revelation of the Trinity right there in the middle. All right. Um, so this is not just me hiding the doctrine of the Trinity and refusing to show it to you. It's me saying, the stuff we will see in here, the, the way the Trinity is made known and made present in Scripture, is um, it's oblique, it's sideways, it's looking back. The main event has already happened, right? And now we're going to look at people presupposing it, but saying enough about it, uh, thank God, that there's a foundation for us to sort of build our ideas on. But the Trinity, Trinitarian reality is already there. So I want to look at three key texts for the Trinity. Um, these are three key places you'd want to go, and I picked these out of all the possible great passages that bring together teaching on this topic. I picked these because they are closest to getting you to that big diagram. Yeah, these are the ones that will kind of help you think biblically through the kind of decisions that you'll end up having to logically affirm something like that one being three persons diagram with the relations, right? Yeah? And then, ultimately, we'll do this after the break, we'll come back and be able to see how that helps us come to terms with heresies, right? So, here are the three key texts. The first one I want to look at is John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I'll put the text up here on the, on the board, but you're free to turn there if you want. John 1, 1 through 3. I crashed the N into verse 3 there accidentally. Sorry about that. Um, In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, we can keep going on, and I'll have to refer to some of the context in a minute, but just look what's going on here in the opening verses of John's Gospel. Um, first of all, it's a book that starts in the beginning, right? And so, if that sounds familiar to you, when you get to John's gospel, you go, where have I heard that before? Go back to the very beginning of the book and go, oh, in the beginning, that's how the whole book started. That's just not a clever way to start your gospel. That's actually John 
Remember how John talks over in 1 John where he says, that which was from the beginning we have, we have uh, looked at, we have heard, we have touched with our hands. What John is saying is, when we met Jesus, when we the apostles, we the eyewitness apostles, he says, met Jesus, we didn't just meet a guy who was born a couple decades ago. What we came into, into contact with there in that man, in that person, is something that had always been there. Right? Now, he was born in the fullness of time and grew in wisdom and knowledge and stature, but the person that was there in the man Jesus Christ, he wasn't someone who just started a while ago. He's someone who was always there, which means what we saw was from the beginning, which means you kind of have to reboot the Bible. If you want to tell the story of Jesus right, you kind of have to go, well, it's not just that, like, um, if you read Matthew and Mark, you might think, so Jesus, the Jesus story starts with John the Baptist, right? No, you really have to go all the way back and say the Jesus story starts with, in the beginning, when God spoke and created the heavens and the earth, there was already something true about God. There was already someone there with God. And so that's how it starts up in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, not God made the heavens and the earth, but in the beginning was the Word. It's a being verb. It's past tense being verb, so you could kind of over-translate it, already was. In the beginning before God made heaven and earth, already was the Word. There was the Word. He was in the beginning with God. Everything that was made was made through Him. So it really is a reverse all the way back to Genesis 1-1. There's new information here, right? It's pretty bold. The Old Testament never tells you what God was doing before He created uh, the heavens and the earth. It just starts, bang, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's go. Here's the story. Um, Augustine of Hippo in the fifth century asked, um, I wonder what God was doing before he made the heavens and the earth. People were always asking him this question for some reason. Finally, he came up with this answer. He said, I'm pretty sure he was making the fires of hell for people who keep asking me that question. <laughs> right? <laughs> Actually, Augustine didn't want to talk that mean, so he said, one clever person has said, right? So he did that thing where you quote somebody, but don't say who it was. Um, the New Testament actually comes through and says, we can say something that was true about God before Genesis 1-1. Now, where do we all these thousands of years later get off saying, I know something that was true about God before the first word of the first book of Moses. I can tell you something about what he was doing. You can search the rest of the Old Testament. The Old Testament, God will not speak through the prophets and tell you what he was doing before he established heaven and earth. All of a sudden, the New Testament comes along and pro uh, apostles start saying things like, before the foundation of the world, we were chosen in Christ. You know, That's a weird, that is not an Old Testament phrase, before the foundation of the world. Where did that come from? Well, it came from the apostles meeting that which was from the beginning. What they met in Jesus Christ was something so absolutely primal in the being of God that you have to put it back before anything was created. Now, pre-existence, we could talk about this doctrine briefly, Christ uh, the Son of God pre-existed His birth as Jesus Christ. So when you celebrate Christmas, um, it's a very special thing, obviously. It's the incarnation of the Son of God. But the Son of God was already the Son of God before He became the Son of Mary, right? He pre-existed. Now, pre-existence is a weird phrase. Um, if you sign up for health insurance, they ask if you have a pre-existing condition, right? And if you want to hassle them a little bit, if you're not too nervous about your health insurance, you could say, what do you mean pre-existing? Do you mean like it's before existence? because then I wouldn't have a condition, right? Are you asking me about an existing condition? Because that's what I would have now. Anyway, that's really irritating, and they, they usually kick you out of the office at that point. Um, a lot of things pre-exist, right? They, they are there, and then, then something else happens with them. The Son of God pre-exists in this absolute sense, right? So you go all the way back here to the very beginning. It's not just that how much older is the Son of God than Jesus Christ incarnate. He's not like a year older. He's not a century older or a millennium older. He's so much older than Christmas, than the incarnation, that he's, he's before in the beginning. Now, that might not be a rational concept, right? I said you can't do a square circle. Can you do before the beginning? Um, I don't know, like five minutes before God made time? What was God doing? In five minutes here, I'm going to create minutes, right? That wouldn't make any sense. So if you get all the way back to the beginning of time and say, what's before the beginning? There's really nowhere to go. Because if you extend it back a few, a few feet, you know, then all you've done is you've made the beginning start earlier, right? You're just cheating the beginning back. If you really go before the beginning, 
you take a big flying leap and you're in God. Like there's, there's nowhere else to go. If, if you're not just cheating and making the beginning older, if you're really going before the beginning, if you're gonna say something that was already there when the beginning started, there's only God. That's Genesis 1-1, right? In the beginning, God did a bunch of stuff. John 1-1, uh, the New Testament message is, in the beginning already was the word. There he was. And then here's the bit um, that gets you really the oddly Trinitarian part. We'll, we'll break our minds here for a minute, and then we'll put them back together if there's time. Um, the word was with God. Now, that's a relationship. There's a distinction there. Um, there's, there's God, and there's the word. The word's with him. Yeah? Um, if I've got someone with me, then great. There are two of us there, and we're having a great time talking. Um, but then it goes on to say the word was God. Well, that's identity, right? So I could have brought my son with me. My son is named Fred. My dad was named Fred. That's one of the reasons my website is called fredfredfred.com. Yeah, there's lots of Freds out there. Um, but notice, we can have relationships and um, distinction from each other. Like I could bring my son Fred and say, I'm Fred. This is Fred. Fred is with Fred. But if I then go on and say, and Fred is Fred, that's just a lie, right? <laughs> like Fred's either with Fred or he is Fred. And I'm changing the meaning of Fred there when I say that, right? So if I have my son come up and say, look, it's Fred and Fred. What do you think? Fred's with Fred. Now watch this. Fred is Fred. No, that's just not true. Okay, well, sit down. Now, Fred is Fred, and Fred is with Fred. You think, I think you're having a mental breakdown up there, right? Like, if you are, if you are yourself and you're with yourself, that's not a healthy mental state. Um, so how can it be true that you are both yourself and with yourself? What's going on there? You see, I mean, this is a very special statement. These are all really short words too, right? This is all, uh, this is very short, simple English because it's very short, simple Greek. John uses very simple tools and says something that forces you to rethink what God must be, right? Turns out the God who's been doing all this stuff, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who brought Israel out of Egypt, turns out we've learned something about him. If Jesus is God, then God must be with the word and the Word must be God. Now, we can say a little bit more about that, um, that there's identity and distinction, and I'm trying to keep this a little bit vague right now to make you do some of the work yourself to think, yeah, how can that be identity and distinction? Um, this Word is both with God, which means something like the second person of the Trinity was with the first person of the Trinity, right? That's not biblical language. I'm using it specifically to be precise and help us nail down what the Bible's meaning here. Um, and yet the Word, the second person of the Trinity, must be also God. But I don't want to confuse the person, so it can't mean the Word is the Father. It must mean the Word is with the Father and is, the, and is divine, is God. See how that works? Try, trying to move through it slowly to, to make you kind of do the heavy lifting yourself. Um, that's got to be what's going on here. In other words, you just bring in the Trinity chart and say, oh, right, because the Father is not the Son and yet the Father is God and the Son is God. And so there's unity and distinction there, both going on at the same time, yeah? Now, you know, I could leave you to yourself a little bit longer and make you sort of run John 1, 1 over and over again in your mind. Wait, he's with God and he is God. He's with God and he is God. He's with God and he is God. Yeah, take a couple centuries. That's what the early Christian church did, right? Like we, we just kind of kept reading that verse for a couple centuries, got the brightest minds we could together and thought, this has just got to come out somehow we're going to have to add the Holy Spirit here in a minute, and this is just going to come out Trinity, because there's unity and distinction. We're monotheists who worship three, and there's only a couple of ways to make that work. In fact, I would submit that there's exactly one way to make that work, and the other ways to try to make it work cheat on the evidence in various ways and end up in heresy, right? So we'll talk about some of the heresies a little bit later, but um, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, one thing you have to do is mess with your translation here, right? So the green, the New World Bible they'll bring doesn't read this way. It reads in a way that um, Greek scholarship does not support. But they've, they've got to uh, work with this to make it say the word was a God. Well, you know, okay, good luck. Um, that's not what it says. Um, but I see how you're trying to dodge relation and identity there at the same time. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. So this gets you the unity and distinction that the doctrine of the Trinity comes to your help and says, if you're tired of pondering this without having words for it, let me give you some words for it. One being multiple persons. That's what's happening here. 
Okay, second verse that I want to point to for the doctrine of the Trinity is uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Again, you can turn there if you want, uh, because it's crucial that you see this for yourself in the text, Um, but I'll, I'll project the whole thing as well. So you guys know the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 18 through 20. Um, All authority, this is Jesus after the resurrection, last thing he says in Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Um, Several interesting things going on here. Um... I just want to focus on one of them. That is that three are named here, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I tried to identify those with little uh, numbers for you. One, two, and three. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But notice also that Jesus says to baptize them in the name, one name, of these three. Baptize them in the name. You could say the name of God. Okay, that would make sense. But instead, he says, baptize them in the name, singular name, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, this is crucial, because what you just did with John 1 was all the heavy lifting of the hard logical work of understanding one God that has at least two persons, right, in which there is unity and distinction, right? And and that's difficult. That's the main logical work you have to do. That's where you burned all your mental calories. Now, what's going on here? There's one name... And then our Lord Jesus, after his resurrection, says the one name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Now, I counted to three there, um, but you could say three is not there in the Bible, right? The word three is not there. It just says Father and Son and Spirit. And I would insist, yeah, but I'm pretty sure I'm allowed to count to three when I'm interpreting Scripture, right? Because there aren't four there, there aren't two there, there's the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, yeah? Well, this matters a lot because uh, as you look at it, what you've got is a need to come up with some kind of uh, uh, word to point to what there's one of there. You can say there's one name, but you're going to have to kind of work with that and say, what is there one of in God? I guess God has one name, this divine name, this divine being, the status of divinity goes to the one God. And yet, now I'm going to have to have a word for these three who's these three that are identified here. So again, I'm trying to leave that vague so you can feel the pressure of needing to think, how am I going to explain this? Of course, I've got the doctrine of the Trinity in my back pocket, and I'm thinking, oh, just here's the doctrine of the Trinity. Aren't you glad to have this handy conceptual tool? This will help you make sense of it. Um, One name, three, I'm going to say persons here, but here's the thing. Trinitarian theology has always been a little bit shy of the word person. It's the right answer, right? If I say, if I give you a test and say one what, three who's, you should say one being, three persons. But again, Augustine of Hippo said, you know why I say persons? It's because when somebody asks me what there are three of in God, I don't want to say nothing. So I say person. Um, But notice, even when we say three persons in God, it's a kind of a, a weird use of the word. I don't say how many persons there are in my car. I say how many people there are. So why don't I say there are three people in God? Because that sounds weird, doesn't it? One God and three people? That would be to say, what I mean by person here is exactly what I mean by person in God. And so by talking a little funny with it, there are a bunch of people here, unless you're the fire marshal. The fire marshal apparently talks about the number of persons that can be in a room, yeah? Um, but I can't vouch for the fire marshal's Trinitarian theology. Normally we say, there are a bunch of people here, but there are three persons in God. Because to be a divine person is different from what it is to be a human person. Now, we're still going to use the word in a way that makes sense in some way, but it's not going to be the exact same way um, for down here as it is for up there. But notice, you've got one what and three who's, which, without any technical language, is kind of an adequate way to talk about the Trinity, right? If you were to go to God and ask, what are you? God might respond to you, one God. That is what I am. But if you were to go to God and ask, who are you? You wouldn't get a one answer. Because who God is, is Father, Son, and Spirit, right? So there's one what, if you're asking God about that, and there are three who's, if you're asking God about, about that. You see, you see how that, that's clear? If you ask the different kinds of questions, you get different answers. Because God is one um, substantial or essential reality, but three personal realities or entities. 
The main reason to use the traditional terms, one being and three persons, is so you don't sound um, like you're doing baby talk or something, right? Like God is one what and three who's. You can only say that so many times before it starts to sound sort of juvenile, right? So um, um, without going all the way upscale with your language, you can embrace the traditional language of one being, three persons. Um, but notice you're not really adding anything to it. You're actually still just looking at the Bible going, what is there one of in God in Matthew 28? And what are there three of in God? Why is there the one name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Why these three? Now, that's more, more of the uh, conceptual work that goes in. But look at this. When I read Matthew 28, uh, and I say that there are three persons, um, I'm saying that there's threeness there. And yet I'm a monotheist. So as someone who believes in one God, now I have to talk about the threeness that I'm seeing here, right? So what do I want to say about the threeness of God if I believe in one God? If I were a tritheist, here's what I could say about the threeness of God. God is three. Like, there are three that are God. There are three gods, and you should worship all three of them because you should worship whatever person is God, and there are three. Um, but I'm not a tritheist. I'm a Trinitarian monotheist. So I'm going to talk about the one God, and I'm going to tell you something about the threeness that there is in the one God. So notice that's kind of it's kind of non-threatening, I hope, to say, of the one God, what do we say about the threeness that's revealed about him? Notice the word threeness. Um, one time I tried to find the first use of the word trinity in English. Like, I know the first use of it in Greek and in Latin. I could do all that. But I wanted to know, like, in English, which is a relatively young language, what's the first occurrence of the word trinity? So I got some Anglo-Saxon theological texts, and I got this word. That first thing with the D with a line through it, that's called a thorn. It's, the, it's a th. Um, so this is Trinus. I can't pronounce Anglo-Saxon, but something like Trinus. T-H-R-Y-N-N-Y-S-S-E. Trinus. The cool thing about Anglo-Saxon is it's so blunt. You know, that clearly just means threeness, right? I don't even speak Anglo-Saxon. I can tell that says threeness. Um, notice, though, if you say it in Latin, it comes out Trinitas. Now, that sounds uptown, right? Trinitas. That, that sounds like Roman Catholic or, or medieval or, or algebraic or something, you know? Trinity. Notice what's going on here and why I'm kind of belaboring this point. When someone says, is the Trinity in the Bible, I always say, I'm always honest, and I say, no, of course not. Get a concordance, turn to the T section, look for the word Trinity. It's not in the Bible. That word is not there. But that's not the whole answer, right? There is threeness in the Bible. And what if someone asked you not, is the word Trinity in the Bible, but they asked you, is the word threeness in the Bible? You'd have to say something like, um, who cares if the word threeness is in the Bible? Why is this about words all of a sudden? Threeness is clearly in the Bible. Look at Matthew 28, 20. Man, there's a threeness there. Now, we could have all kinds of disagreements about what we think about that threeness, but you can't deny there's a threeness there. And there's something like that going on when someone asks, is the, is the word Trinity in the Bible? Um, when I admit, because I want to communicate clearly, nope, that, the T word is not in Scripture. The rest of my mind is thinking, but what a silly question to ask if what you're actually asking is if the thing itself is there. Because the thing itself is there. There's only one God, and the Father sends the Son and the Spirit, and we're saved because of the triune work of God. And we baptize in the name of one, two, and three. Right? So threeness is right there. And if I were talking Latin, I would say Trinity is right there in Matthew 28. You see that? doesn't do all the work. We still have to actually come to terms with what we mean about the Trinity. Um, all kinds of heretics mean all kinds of things by the threeness they see in the Bible. But notice, we're all working on the same project. What do we monotheists say about this threeness? And by the way, um, that's why the word trinity ought to be relatively non-threatening, whereas triunity, I put it in quotes here because it's a special made-up word, by throwing that little u into the Latin root, um, you're, you're saying threefold oneness. Now, that's a special word. That bundles it all together and is one big claim. What do you think about the threefold oneness of God? Oh, well, that's different. That's the whole claim of the actual doctrine of the Trinity. But threeness itself shouldn't be controversial. Um, it's just a matter of going on to say the right thing about one God. And what's the right thing? One being in three persons. All right, that is our first two of three uh, it's just coincidentally, you know, that there are three main Bible texts that I want to take you here. Like all, all sermons don't have to have three points, and all, all three points don't necessarily point to the Trinity. Um, but I want to, we're going to take a short break here, and then I want to come back for the third one, because it takes us in a slightly different direction, uh, and then we'll be able to move on to the actual treatment of Trinitarian heresies, yeah? So um, 
Let's come back at 3.05, uh, take a short break for the restrooms, which are right out there to the right. It's probably your home church. I'm the guest. I think they're over there. All right, thanks a lot. See you back here at 3.05. I've heard it said of some preachers and teachers that um, they know how to take a doctrine apart, but they just don't know how to put it back together again. I don't know if you've ever been through that kind of a sermon. So I was a little anxious about taking a break because I think I've got it all taken apart now, but we really need to kind of make sure we put it back together again here. Um, that is that we've done the, uh, the analytic task of taking things apart, but now we need to do the synthetic task of reassembling the elements of the doctrine of the Trinity. And we're partway there. Um, we've done John 1, 1, which requires you to understand God himself having some kind of unity and distinction, and makes you really have to rethink the whole Old Testament. Um, not that the doctrine of the Trinity was revealed in the Old Testament, but that now, based on what we have learned from Jesus Christ, we can do a reread of the entire Old Testament, um, and not so much find verses we haven't read before, um, but understand that the God behind all of this is Father, Son, and Spirit just hasn't made it known yet, but now we know and the lights are on. Say more about that um, later on. Secondly, we've done Matthew 28, where we are to baptize in the one name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and this is what it is to become disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, I'm not talking about saying the right formula of water baptism. Water baptism. I'm talking about um, a theological understanding of what it is to be a believer in Jesus Christ, to be a disciple in his language. Ready to go on to the third one now. Oh, I also did a short defense of the use of the word Trinity, um, kind of a minimal use of Trinity, right? I'm not saying much when I say Trinity. Part of the problem with the word Trinity is it sounds like it's saying a lot, because it is. There's a lot of church history and a lot of thought that's gone into this. But the last key verse I want to look at is 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Um, the very end of uh, the book of 2 Corinthians, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, one thing to say is this is Paul doing the thing I told you Paul does, not teaching about the doctrine of God, but just saying by, and he can't say by without going all Trinitarian on it, right? So he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, I take God here uh, as it is through most of Paul's writings, to be a reference to God the Father. Um, Ninety-something percent of the time when the word God, Greek word theos, when the word God occurs in the New Testament, it's a reference to God the Father. There are a handful of times where Jesus is called God in various ways, and there you can tell clearly from the context it's pointing to Jesus as God. Um, but most of the time, God means God the Father. Simple proof of that, aside from you can kind of see here, if you're trying to count to three, God must point to what we would call the first person of the Trinity. But the simplest proof is look over at John 3:16. God so loved the world that he did what? Gave his only son. Well, what kind of God has a son that he can give to the world that he loves? Well, it's got to be God the Father, right? So John 3:16 means God the Father. Even though it doesn't say God the Father, it says God, the word theos, that one word God right there. Um, but it's got to mean God the Father because God loved the world so much, he gave his son. That makes him what we would call then the first person of the Trinity, to use the technical language. So um, I think the same thing's going on here in Paul. Uh, and you can also see this in his other benedictions if you compare how he signs off his other letters. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and the love of God the Father. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture, no surprise, because um, one of the things that's happening here, oops, I'll go back for that in a minute. One of the things that's going on here is we're getting not just a statement about the eternal being of God, but we're getting a really uh, powerful presentation of the roles or offices or works of the distinct persons of the Trinity in the one thing that they're doing together. In the one thing that they're doing together, if you were to say, which one of the persons of the Trinity makes me think about love? I, mean, I think a lot of us would probably say Jesus. We'd think about, you know, Jesus loves you. I think about the love of Jesus. But actually, while it's totally biblical to think about the love of Jesus and Jesus loving you, right? Um, Galatians 2.20, the life I, live by, life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's totally biblical to think that way. 
But if you study all the references to God the Father in the New Testament, love is constantly being attributed to God the Father, right? It's not that God so hated the world he had to send his son so he could have mercy, right? God so loved the world that he undertook the costly giving of his one and only son to bring about salvation, right? Love of God, uh, love goes with God the Father. Um, the other big things that go with God the Father, you would kind of think if I did a word study of God the Father, what would I find? You'd think you might find authority, sternness. Um, I don't know what else would you think about Father. Often what we're doing is kind of projecting our own Father stuff onto what ought to be a Bible study about God the Father. Like one of the things that Heavenly Father means is Father means He's like your Father. Heavenly means He's not like your Father, right? That's, that's, when Jesus says Father in Heaven, that's what He's doing. It's a, yeah, it's enough here to start some analogical reasoning about what God is like. He's like a good Father. Heavenly means, oh yeah, so you probably, even if you've got a great father, you don't have a father like this father. This is the other father. Um, yeah, if you do an actual word study on God the Father, it's constantly the love of the Father. Um, the Father is the one who properly loves us and sends the Son for that reason. Notice it goes second here. Why not, since Matthew 28, 20 says, Father, Son, Spirit, that's the traditional form. We traditionally say in hymns and songs and, and things we say in church, Father, Son, and Spirit, following that order. Paul goes, Son, Father, Spirit, Christ, God, Spirit. Um, why? I kind of think Paul's saying, here's the love of God. Now, the love of God starts everything, but if you want access to the love of God, you've got to get to it through the grace of Jesus Christ. So he closes and he starts with, the only way in is through the grace of Jesus Christ. Grace happens in Jesus Christ. That's where it's accomplished and available to you. And then through that experience of grace, you then come into an experience and an encounter with the love of God the Father. And when you do that, then you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And for some reason here, fellowship, communion, koinonia is the Greek, um, is a spirit word. And it always makes me think of what John says over in 1 John, our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. If I were desperate to find Trinity verses, I'd claim that line in 1 John is a Trinity verse, and I'd cram the Holy Spirit into the word fellowship, right? Because when John says our fellowship is with the Father and the Son, uh, as a Trinitarian, I'm always thinking, and with the Spirit, right? But the Bible's not nervous about having to cram the Spirit into everything. The Spirit is pervasive and everywhere and often presupposed and not necessarily stated. So our fellowship is with the Father and the Son, and here we have fellowship being a work among us of the Holy Spirit. So what you really got going on here and shown, not, not so much taught, but presupposed and glimpsed through 2 Corinthians 13, 14, is that salvation is going on. It's, it's by the triune God, right? Father, Son, and Spirit make salvation, bring about salvation, cause salvation. They work salvation. Um, but it's also coming to us from the triune God. And I would say, I don't mean we're saved from Him. I mean, the salvation comes from God. Um, in a stronger sense than just salvation is made by him. Salvation actually is a kind of opening up of who God is for our experience, right? That we need to be saved and joined to God. And so God doesn't do it at arm's length, but actually since he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in himself, he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for us. So that um, triunity, like God's being as who he is, kind of reaches out and embraces us. And salvation comes from that. You see, that, that's the kind of vision that's going on here. That's sort of the main thing my book, The Deep Things of God, is about, is that strong connection between the gospel and the Trinity. But I would also say, um, since it's by God and from God, it's also sort of in God. Not that we become God or anything like that, not that we become deified, but that we are brought into relationships that are proper to God, that that father-son relationship is something that the spirit of sonship unites us to, so that we are adopted children of God, um, so that the eternal Son becomes the incarnate Son who dies and rises for us so that we can become adopted sons, right? So um, in that sense, this salvation is in the Trinity. In that sense, you're in those Trinitarian relations. God doesn't make another set of relationships, right? Like, in here I have Father, Son, and Spirit relationships. I also have creature relationships. There are none of those in here, but one of the relationships I'm now going to have for the salvation of the creature is these relationships, Father, Son, and Spirit, yeah? That works better with diagrams than with fingers, but um, you get the idea. Um, so, salvation is by and with, uh, in and with the triune God, so we are experiencing this reality of the triune God 
Um, yeah, this works because we have specific commitments to what salvation is. Uh, that is, salvation is a particular thing. The gospel brings about a particular kind of salvation. If you have a lower view of what salvation is, then you can have a lower view of who Jesus and the Spirit are, right? Sometimes when I talk to Jehovah's Witnesses and they say, Jesus isn't God, I say, well, I suppose the kind of salvation being described by the Jehovah's Witness organization could be accomplished by a non-divine Savior, but it's not very good salvation. It's not the kind of intimate, personal reconciliation with, um, uh, with the Father that an actual son can bring about. You see that? So the, the high view of the person and work of the Son and the Spirit is linked to a high view of what the gospel brings about. Yeah? You ever think about that? If, if our problem was we were being bullied around by demons, how could God save us? Send some angels. That would totally accomplish salvation. If all you mean by salvation is getting demons to leave you alone, Michael can pull it off for you. Right? Um, if all you mean by salvation is missing hell and hitting heaven, and you haven't thought any harder about what that means, I'm all for missing hell and hitting heaven. But if that's all I'm doing is picking a destination, then that could also be accomplished, if that's all I know about it, by someone less than God. Yeah? If I'm broke, God could write me a check, right? Just a rich person would be adequate if that's all I mean by salvation is I don't have any money. But if my problem with God is that I am estranged from Him and need to be reconciled, if I have a personal problem with God because of blood guiltiness on my head, then that can only be rectified by God Himself. You can't forgive for somebody else. You can't do personal reconciliation by proxy or by deputy. You can't send someone to bring about a new relationship. You have to come yourself to do it. And that's what Jesus makes the point of over and over again. You know the parable about um, the rich man had a vineyard, and he sent messengers um, to talk to the people who were attending the vineyard, and they mistreated the messengers. So what did he finally say? I'll send my son. That's basically a little tiny version of the story of the Bible. Lots of messengers, finally in these last days, I will send my own son. Yeah? Um, and because the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one in the unity of the one God, for God to send the Son is not just for God to send another agent. It's actually for God to come and be here in the person of the Son. So that's what we've got. That's kind of the main thing that's going on with the Trinity. Having landed there and linked gospel and Trinity, we've got these three verses— um, John 1, 1, Matthew 28, and 2 Corinthians 13. Um, these I would want to treat as windows into the doctrine of the Trinity, and I wanted to be really specific with them and help you to see in them the, all the key decisions that need to ma be made for the Trinity. Because what I really think about the doctrine of the Trinity is it's pervasive throughout Scripture. It's kind of the main meaning of the whole Bible. And when the early church sat down and said, if you were going to take everything you believe from the whole Bible and try to fit it on an index card— how would you do that? What would you boil that down to? Well, that's a hard task, right? What do you leave out? Samson? Yeah, we can leave out Samson. Totally believe in Samson. I like him. Great story, but I'm not going to put him in my one index card thing. So you get it down to just the bare minimum, the main thing God was communicating through everything that's uh, described here in Scripture. Basically, the early church said, it's going to go something like this. I believe in God the Father Almighty and in His only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit. That's roughly how the summary is going to go. It's going to be a Trinitarian summary of the entire content of Scripture. So now that's what I actually think, and that's the way I really want to teach um, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. But notice it's kind of unhelpful. Like if you ask me, where's the Trinity in the Bible? And I say, the whole thing, but also nowhere, right? Like it's, it's, it's a biblical doctrine that's in between the pages of Scripture and all over it. Um, I actually do believe that, but it doesn't sound honest. So that's why I want to make sure to say, see these three, see the decisions you have to make in these points. That should be a window into the fact that Scripture is pervasively Trinitarian. And I hope that as you reread through Scripture, you'll be spotting Trinity everywhere from now on, right? That um, once I've kind of alerted you to it, I don't have to hold your hand and walk you through and make sure you see it everywhere. It's all over the place. It's like your next walk through the woods if you walk through the woods all your life, you know, there's a certain path you always take, but then you go through with a trained conservationist who can tell you why everything is where it is. <sighs> really? I had no idea those species would go together for particular reasons. From then on, you walk through it. From then on, you go, oh, I get it. Everything I see confirms what I have now been alerted to. That's what I hope and pray your experience of Bible study will be after this sort of um, intensive focus on the Trinity for a couple hours. 
So we're actually ready finally to get the heresies. I put this slide on here to make sure I remembered. Uh, oh yeah, the heresies, right? That was kind of in the title. We got to get to that. So um, this brings us back to the logical diagram. It's a cold analytic tool, but it really kind of brings together in one place all the logical relationships that you need to make the doctrine of the Trinity. And here's a person holding that diagram. I know you would like to avert your eyes, but I'm going to make you look at this for a second. It turns out there's a lot in the doctrine of the Trinity, and one of the things that this artist is struggling with is the fact that it's hard to say everything at once, right? The doctrine of the Trinity is a really big and comprehensive doctrine, and so um, I've just I got to get this off the screen here in a minute because this is terrible. Every, every hundred years or so, someone makes paintings like this, and every hundred years or so, the Pope and the religious authorities in charge say, stop it, right? However you say that in Latin, they issue an official encyclical saying, thou shalt not make such images. Um, back in the fourth century, Gregory of Nazianzus in uh, what's now Turkey said, whoever thinks of God as some three-faced thing will never see the face of God, whatever the face of God looks like. So it's something like, I don't know what the face of God looks like, but not that. <laughs> but you know, you got to pity the artist. What's he doing here? He's going, God is one, but three, somehow at once, and whoever's seen the Son has seen the Father, so, uh, and out comes this. And uh, that's, that's um, John and Luke, the evangelists there on the little um, uh, clouds beside them. Say it, Juan ev uh, Evangelis and uh, San Lucas there. Um, and they look like they're rolling their eyes. I think they're supposed to be adoring God or something or being pious, but they really look to me like, oh, brother. Right. <laughs> which is my thought there. So, you know, I'm making fun of this poor artist who did his best to make you think about Jesus and God and the one God and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all at once. It is hard to get your mind around that whole thing, right? And so the concepts and the biblical judgments that we've made here, that we've seen in Scripture, that we feel, I hope that you feel the need to make those, they can kind of live in our head now as sort of a complex thing which fortunately, we can't, you can't say all at once. It's going to take a couple of sentences to get it all out. But if you made a painting of it, it'd be kind of awful. There it is. So we could get better. Not that there's a better painting of the Trinity, because, you know, good luck. Like, go paint the Trinity. That's, they're all, I've seen thousands of images of the Trinity. They're all wrong. And it's not like I can take a picture out of my wallet and say, they're wrong because I compared them to this. It's just you're not going to do it with visuals, Right? I mean, you're going to make a set of judgments about what God has said in Scripture, and you're going to have one big, comprehensive, biblical idea about who God is. That includes the unity of God, the oneness of God, the deity of Christ, the deity of the Spirit, all that stuff in this entire diagram. That's the great value of uh, a logical, conceptual, doctrinal kind of boiling down of all the wondrous glory of what it is that God has made known. And, of course, it gives us a great tool to understand some heresies and to avoid them. So let me just name a few here and show you how they fit into the doctrine of the Trinity. One heresy to avoid, tritheism. So um, we talked about asking what you think about the threeness in God. Well, if you say the threeness in God goes all the way to the being of God to the extent that there are three beings in God, that's just to say that there are three gods. And so that's tritheism, uh, you know, three godism. That's an error. For one thing, it would mean you couldn't carry the entire Bible around. You're going to have to get rid of the monotheism of the Old Testament, which is, of course, reaffirmed in the New Testament, yeah? So this is a monotheistic book that tells us about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit always having been there, being in the nature of God. Now, who believes tritheism? Not many people. This is actually very rare. Um, I start with it because it's an obvious error to make with the doctrine of the Trinity, but it's very hard to find tritheists either now walking around, knocking on your door, trying to get you to join their group, um, or in the entire history of the church. It's just, you got to work pretty hard to, to read this book and come up with three gods. But it's important for us to avoid giving the impression of tritheism. So if you get really excited about the Trinity and start talking a lot about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, you can sometimes give the impression that these three are kind of a club. And this especially happens when, when some people get excited about the Trinity's like a team that really sticks together. So team, we should stick together because we're a team like the Trinity. Well, I don't think that person's a tritheist, but that kind of argument 
um, begins to go in the direction of tritheism. Do you see that? So it's, it's not a tritheist argument, but the difference between the three-person team I'm on and the triunity of God is so great, I would say it's infinitely greater than the similarity between God's team and the three-person team I'm on, right? So if you've got an analogy and the point of similarity is infinitely inferior to the point of dissimilarity, it's, it's probably too limited to work with, yeah? And people will also apply this not just in terms of a three-person team, but of a church. They'll say something like, I have some Bible verses that make me want to say the entire church community, community is a great warm word that we use a lot now, this whole community is like the Trinitarian community. Well, again, I don't think that's the heresy of tritheism. I don't think it goes that far. Um, but it can give some people the impression of tritheism. Does that make sense? So if you start using that kind of language, um, kind of try to, <laughs> try to simultaneously hear what it sounds like and what it might sound like to a listener. It's especially important if you're dealing in a context where you're talking with a lot of Muslims, because an intelligent, educated Muslim that hears you talk that way is going to think, I knew it. I knew Christians weren't monotheists. And so you're going to want to be able to address them in a way that doesn't confirm their suspicion that we're not tritheists. Uh, wait, that we are tritheists. I got lost at the end of that sentence. Right. Um, you want to reassure them that Christians are doing monotheism. Yeah. Other things to say about how to communicate that with um, Muslims. But where you will find something like tritheism is Mormonism, kind of. So um, some Mormons or members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are really warm to Trinitarianism because when you start talking a lot about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they see three who are God, and that reminds them that in their way of understanding what God or a God is, there are multiple beings who are God. So there's a sense in which Mormons will tell you they believe in the Trinity, and they kind of do. One way to say this is that, well, they don't believe in the Trinity. They believe in three who are God. It's just that they believe in three beings who are God. In fact, they believe in a whole lot of beings who are God because it's not ultimately a monotheistic uh, way of believing in God, right? Ultimately, if God is a glorified human, uh, then you're dealing with an actual polytheistic setting. Does that make sense? So Mormons can be very confusing on this front, but I, I almost won't talk to Mormons about the doctrine of the Trinity, um, either at the lay level, you know, when I just meet them in life, or even at the scholarly level when I'm talking to them at a theological conference. I'll usually change the subject because um, the metaphysic is all messed up, right? Like the definition of what the being of God is, is totally incompatible. So um, yeah, they kind of believe in tritheism, but they actually believe in just plain old polytheism. All right. Next error, next heresy um, is modalism. Now modalism is a doctrine that you've really got one God, one being who is God, and one person who is God. So this is unipersonalism. Um, modalism is you've really got one God doing three things. Notice, not being three persons, but doing three different things. So that ultimately, generally the Father is the real God, they would say. And the Father does sonship and then does spiritship something like that, right? So you really have this one unipersonal God who sort of does three different things, and we should approach those as three different ways. Um, there are lots of different ways to teach this. One would be sort of um, a dynamic way of doing it, like first he's God the Father, then he's God the Son, then he's God the Spirit. It would be kind of like serial, like talking about serial monogamy. This would be like serial monotheism, right? Um, so like first he's the father and he makes the world, then he starts feeling suddenly, so he becomes incarnate, then he gets all spiritual and becomes the Holy Spirit, right? But it's the same person doing these three different things. Now, then you might say, no, wait a minute, I think they're all on stage at the same time, right? So it's not like Clark Kent left and Superman came in. That won't work because I actually saw Clark Kent interviewing Superman, so they must be different persons. So for instance, the baptism of Christ, the son is in the water, the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, and the spirit descends in the form of a dove. Seems like you've got to hire three actors there if you're going to film that, though one is a bird and works cheap. Um, so that would then make you say, I'm still going to be modalist because I still believe there's essentially one unipersonal God, um, but I think there's somehow three modes at one time. Like God has different modes for different moods or different masks for different tasks or different ways of getting at things, but they can't actually know each other. Somehow it's a unipersonal God doing three things 
even if it's simultaneous. Does that make sense? Yeah? We're kind of going like um, tritheism is too much threeness and modalism is too much oneness, right? Uh, and, and Trinitarianism is a way of getting at what's one in God and getting at what's three in God without contradicting yourself or falling off one side or the other of the table. Who's a modalist? Well, there's a movement, a fairly big uh, and growing movement called Oneness Pentecostalism. They sometimes refer to themselves as apostolic. Um, yeah, pretty big movement. Um, yeah, well, I know it's out here in this area. A few years ago, I debated um, Anthony Buzzard, who's a, one of the teachers uh, in this kind of a movement. Um, no, no, Buzzard's not. Buzzard's something else. He's, um, man, it's hard to keep the heresies straight. Um, Oneness Pentecostalism. Is, here's the great thing about Oneness Pentecostalism. They're really clear on the deity of Christ. They're so sure Jesus is God that they think he's God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, right? So um, remember the, the motto about not dividing the substance, tritheism, or confounding, confusing the persons. That's modalism, confuses the person. So in the Oneness Pentecostal view, um, God is... Um, Jesus is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so to baptize in his name is to baptize in the name of Jesus, because Jesus is the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And like I said, some of them make t-shirts that say Jesus is God the Father. And that's really nice and clear. I mean, it's clearly wrong. That's what I like about it. It's nice and clearly wrong. Because um, the way to confuse modalists is to say, who was Jesus praying to? And this really messes with their heads, right? Because then you've got to explain how that's going to work. Um, one other thing to say about modalism, uh, just as I said you shouldn't give the impression of tritheism, you shouldn't give the impression of modalism. So a lot of times we can talk about the one God and sort of um, uh, background the eternal identity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in their distinction from each other. So that's a, a way of talking that's to be avoided. Uh, the other major error to make is subordinationism. This is the view that there's really one real God and then a couple of lesser gods. So the way this would work out is you're sure that God the Father is God, and Jesus is also God, but like with a small g. Um, this, is, this is a little bit confusing because it, it sounds right at first because they want to say something like Jesus is God or divine, kind of. But what I would want to say is they can't really mean it. If you're a subordinationist, you say, there's the Father, and there's the Son, and the Son is less than the Father. He is other in his being. He is other than the Father. Um, if you were going to ask, like, what kind of stuff is God made of, then the Son would be made of different stuff than the Son. What did I just say? The Son would be made of different stuff than the Father. Well, you've got to listen to what you say, because I, I know what I meant, but it came out wrong. Um, so that would be subordinationism. And, and so generally, if you're going to treat the Father as the real God and the Son as a lesser God, Sometimes you have the Holy Spirit on the same plane with the Son, but usually he ends up going even lower, right? And um, if you also deny the personhood of the Spirit and treat him as a power or a force or a, a thing God does, that's another form of subordinationism. Um, the Holy Spirit really gets the short end of the stick on subordinationism a lot, but you'll tend to notice it more as a heresy with people who demote the Son from full deity to some sort of qualified deity or lesser deity. This also goes with the heresy of adoptionism, where you think Jesus started out human but turned into God, um, like he was adopted into Godhood. Uh, that's kind of a weird one. I'm not sure it's consistently thinkable, um, but you can see how the kind of God that a mere man could become has to be a lower kind of God than God-God. So that ends up being the same kind of error. Who is subordinationist? I'm not asking for a show of hands. I'm, I'm going to give some examples. Um, well, Arianism is the classic form, uh, and that is the uh, teaching of Arius, the priest in Alexandria back in the fourth century. Um, and it's pretty straightforward that the one God made everything, but first he made the Word or the Logos, and then through that super angel, highest of all possible creatures, the Word, the one God used that super creature to make everything else. Here's the tricky bit with the Arians. They could even say um, that the one God made the Word who then made time, and so the word actually is before all time and before all creatures, but he's still not God. Um, now, that's kind of cool, because compared to someone who thinks Jesus is just human, someone who thinks he's the superest, duperest angel ever has a relatively high Christology. You see that? The difference between someone who says Jesus is just a man and someone who says Jesus is the first and greatest angel through whom everything was made. But 
think about that. Go to the very highest possible creature and then consider the jump from there to God. How far is it? Well, it's still infinite, right? So the greatest creature might be way above a mere man, but who cares? It's sort of like saying, I can swim further toward Europe than you can, right? Like none of us are going to get there, so it really doesn't matter. Like on a satellite photo, we're both going to drown at the same place, right? You'd have to really zoom in to see who got closer. I guess from here, we'd rather swim to Asia. Um, that's the deal with these high Christologies that are still subordinationistic, right? It really underestimates the distance from here to God. Like, it doesn't matter how high, how far your flying leap can go. It's still just a flying leap from the creature's side, and there's still an infinite distance between the highest creature and God. Um, Arianism, in pretty much that exact form, is still around today in the form of the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, who are eager to knock on your door, invite you to the kingdom hall, and explain their theology to you. They have lots of things they want to say. It is best with Jehovah's Witnesses to go straight for the deity of Christ. So, I'm a specialist in the doctrine of the Trinity. I love to argue with people about the Trinity. I rarely get a chance. Mormons want to argue about the Trinity. I'll change the subject to what their idea of God is, right? Like, what, what kind of a God could be polytheistic, etc.? Jehovah's Witnesses always want to argue about the Trinity because they think it's complicated and easy to attack. I always change the subject to who do you think Jesus is, right? Because unless you've got Jesus as fully divine, you wouldn't need the doctrine of the Trinity, right? If Jesus isn't God, well, all your hard thinking is done at that point, right? The hard and interesting bits come once you affirm Jesus is God and there's only one God and Jesus isn't the Father. That's when you have to kind of going to go into this whole thing. Okay, um, last thing to say here, those are the main heresies. Last thing I want to say is that there's a danger zone. It's not heretical, but it kind of gets us into a danger zone when you start thinking about illustrations of the Trinity. Now, I already showed you up there in the left corner a truly horrific literal illustration of the Trinity, a painting of the Trinity. That's just bad. I'm leaving it up there to scare you because we're close to Halloween. Um, Here's the thing to remember when you start getting into illustrations of the Trinity. First key point is there's nothing like God or like God's triunity, right? Um, there's nothing like God. So a lot of times I say, hey, I'm going to talk about the Trinity. I talk about the Trinity, and people ask, what's a good illustration of the Trinity? And I always have to say, well, there isn't one, right? I mean, I can offer some examples. We can argue by analogy, and we can give some metaphors and things. But it's sort of like I said, if I said God made heaven and earth, and you said, what's that like? Can you give me an example of something else that made heaven and earth? Like, what's something like that? It's like, oh, I don't, it's, nothing's like making heaven and earth. Like, I made a sandwich this afternoon. That's kind of like making heaven and earth, don't you think? It's got two layers, yeah. Um, but no, it's, you know, it's a little bit like making heaven and earth, and it's infinitely different from making heaven and earth. So it can give you a really dim view, like, oh, I guess that's what creating the cosmos ex nihilo would be like. You just made everything from nothing. Sort of like you went to the fridge and got out meat and made a sandwich. Um, so this is about your expectations. If I say there is one being who is three persons, and you say, really, what's that like? Then I have to say, it, it's actually not like anything. Sorry, I'll see you later. Right? Um, now, you know, you can do more than that. There's some things you can do to kind of help conceptualize and little illustrations like, you know how when I'm out and I get a sunburn, it's because the sun has been here on my hand, but, and yet the sun is there, and yet the light of the sun is the presence of the sun. You can't divide the sun from the shining of the sun. What would the sun be without its shining? That's kind of like the relation of the first and second person of the Trinity. Ooh, that's neat. You can really kind of do something with that and think about it, right? You can actually kind of do a unity distinction thing there, yeah? I talked about Fred being Fred and being with Fred. That's kind of an illustration of how it couldn't work. Um, but you see how you can, you can be, really let your mind go and actually reach out and try to get your mind around these concepts. That's fine to do that. Be careful when you think you've really nailed the illustration that gets it, right? You're likely to paint one of those three face things. Because here's the other thing. Most illustrations are a little bit helpful for understanding the Trinity, but are perfect illustrations of subtrinitarian heresies, right? So this, like most illustrations you come up with, like, I think I've got something for what the Trinity is like. I'm like a, I'm a speaker who goes and talks in churches about the Trinity, and I'm also a husband who's married to my wife, and I'm also a father of my children. So like there's one me, but there are three different me's. That's kind of how it is, right? You're going to go, well, that that's gives me a little inkling that's a little helpful for relating one and three, 
So, you know, a tiny little glimpse there, maybe, but it is a perfect illustration of the heresy of modalism. Like, that's brilliant. That exactly incorporates the modalist heretical error. Good job. So, what you got to be careful with with these illustrations is to make sure you're using them in the right way, be clear what you're using them to help you get your mind around and specify conceptually, and then say no a lot the whole time, right? Like, it's not like this, it's not like that. It also means don't think about getting the right illustration as being the capstone of your knowledge of the Trinity. Like, I'll really understand the Trinity if I can tell you what it's like. Well, remember point one, it's not like anything, right? Like, give me an example of, give me an illustration of someone who's omniscient. Sorry, one, God. Okay, well, give me an illustration of omnipotence. Again, we're, we're, we're talking about God here. Okay, then give me an illustration of the Trinity. Well, in this sense, the, tr the doctrine of the Trinity is nothing special. It's one of the things that names what God and God alone is. And so there's a story about St. Patrick uh, uh, evangelizing Ireland, and um, he picks up a shamrock and says, hey, you Irish guys, you love shamrocks, right? Behold, God's kind of like this. One shamrock, three petals, or whatever you call those things. Well, according to the legend, the Irish all fell down on their knees and said, Begora, we'll worship the Trinity. All I have to say is if you have a chance to convert Ireland in one fell swoop, go for it, right? <laughs> like, use whatever illustration you want. Apparently it worked, and results actually matter. But the longer you think about a shamrock, the less it's like God. Right? Like, it's not one in three in anything remotely resembling the way God is one in three. Now, it led to the conversion of a whole nation and lots of beautiful Celtic artwork, so great. I'm not upset about it. Um, but you also can't do much more with it conceptually than that, yeah? Because God's not like anything. The last point here on illustrations is the main things in the doctrine of the Trinity are the plain things. That means God the Father saved us by sending the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, if you want to know what God the Trinity is like, God the Trinity is like the Father so loving the world that He gives His only Son, and in the fullness of time, putting the spirit of sonship into our hearts by which we cry, Abba, Father. That is to say, the Trinity is not out there somewhere where we're wondering what to compare it to. The Trinity is our experience of God in the gospel, right? God has opened His life up to us so that this word of who He is is not far off, so we have to climb up analogies in order to get it. We're actually living an experience of the reality of the Trinity in living the Christian life. Um, so I would probably summarize all of that by saying that the Trinity is not a distraction from the gospel, but is a super-condensed explanation of it, right? That's why in the book, Deep Things of God, I say, the Trinity is the gospel. But I also say, don't put that on your bumper sticker, because that suggests to people something like, um, if the Trinity is the gospel, then I can only be saved if I affirm the theology of the Trinity, right? That's, that's how it sounds, because people are still sort of, when they're reading your bumper sticker, they're kind of on the outside of the message, reading it, saying, so you're saying something like, the Trinity is as important as the gospel, and I have to affirm it, or I'll go to hell. Well, that's where we started, right? That's where we started when we were saying, if you think about it, your head will explode, but if you deny it, you'll lose your soul. Get inside the doctrine of the Trinity by getting inside the understanding and experience of the gospel. Once you're in there, you look around and say, this only makes sense if God is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who has brought about our salvation by bringing us into fellowship with Him in this way. All right? Thank you. Go back one? Yeah. That far? Yeah. Okay. By the way, this, um, this presentation I put together, the software is called Prezi, P-R-E-Z-I. -E I mentioned that not as an advertisement, but to let you know this is online. If you go to Prezi.com and just search for my name, Fred Sanders, um, this is there. You can, you can view it online yeah, through any viewer. P-R-E-Z-I, -E Prezi. All right, we've got about 15 minutes, and I'd be glad to take any questions of any kind on the doctrine of the Trinity and heresies related to it. Uh, yeah. Our, yeah. Oh, we're going to run the mic around the, uh, to people. Oneness, oneness, uh, Pentecostalism. Yeah. The uh, D. L. Moody had said something similar to um, uh, Christ being equal with the Father, or being the Father, the okay. Holy Spirit, and that he was nothing 
lesser, to say that uh, he was anything lesser or anything, uh, I forget how he phrased it exactly, but I, hmm. I thought it was kind of funny. Okay. So this is a, a statement by Dwight Moody that yeah. seemed to, like you could interpret it in one direction or another? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, so a couple of things to say there. Uh, the thing about, in general, about heresies, they've always got this grain of truth to them, right? I mean, they're, they're, they've always got one element of truth that they're taking in isolation from the others and really uh, blowing out of all proportion. And, and so um, that's why you'll hear, you know, orthodox statements that remind you of heretical statements. And, and sometimes you can hear heretical statements and false doctrine will actually bring something to mind that you think, oh, that is important. They're saying it wrong. They're affirming it the wrong way. They're, they're using it to deny other things. But um, sort of like God uses affliction to build character, God can use heresy uh, to bring about greater understanding of the truth. Because the other thing about heresy, and that doesn't, um, just because God can use affliction to build character doesn't mean you should go out and afflict people and say that like, the Lord works in mysterious ways, and I'm one of them, right? Similarly, just because the Lord uses heresy to increase theological understanding doesn't mean we should let a thousand heresies blossom all over the church, because after all, they're going to work to build understanding, right? Like, those are, those are evils to be opposed, but God can make all things work together for good. The other thing is, the grains of truth that heresies develop, not only are they little things that are actually true if they were understood the right way, they tend to be things the church has neglected. So um, you could kind of think of heresies in general as kind of a, I don't know, like a sweeper service that find the things we've let fall off the table and go for it, you know? So if you're in a church that's really good at affirming the deity of Christ, but we're not very clear on the humanity of Christ, like Jesus is so God, I can't imagine that how he could ever walk around and leave footprints anywhere. Right? Um, well, that's a dangerous situation that a church is in, and often a heretical group will come in and overemphasize the humanity of Christ precisely because we haven't emphasized it properly um, in the church. Right? So that's it. The other thing is we just need to cut each other some slack on, um, on the heresy hunting in general. Um, so yeah, does Moody say things? I mean, Dwight Moody, great guy, did incredible things, um, knew that he was not an educator, uh, when he started a Bible institute, he went out and hired somebody else to run it, because I think Moody had a sixth grade education and thought, I can't run a Bible institute. I can't run an educational institution. Let me hire R.A. Torrey. He's, you know, got two degrees from Yale. Um, when you hear someone say something that seems a little off uh, on a doctrine like this, you know, you want clarity, so you should get asked some questions about that and try to get clear on it. But you can imagine, as a, as a specialist who's kind of professionally obsessed with the doctrine of the Trinity, I hear all kinds of terrible things all the time um, in great churches. So my home church, which I love, um, every now and then you'll hear someone pray something like, Father, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. And, you know, I'm praying along and I'm going, wait a minute, what? The Father, the father did what now? Almost all the time what's happening is the person has started praying and their mind has kind of gone to another thing, and they're praying that, sometimes in the same sentence, right? If you actually shook them from their prayer, say, wait, wait, stop praying and take a theology test real quick. Did the Father die on the cross for our sins? They'd almost always get the right answer, and you'd almost always be a jerk for stopping their prayer, right? Um, if you hear them do it a lot, it's probably worth taking them aside and saying, you know, I think what happens is like, when you say Father, often you're just saying like, that's just dialing. You know, like you're just dialing to start the prayer and then you begin talking to Jesus. It's fine to talk to the Father and to talk to Jesus and talk to the Spirit, even in the same prayer. But a lot of times people, since they're not performing in a prayer, um, they don't note that they've made a transition. So similarly, I hear people thank Jesus for sending his son for our salvation. And I think, what? Jesus doesn't have a son. Um, but I don't, I don't push the heresy buzzer right there either, I think. That prayer kind of got away from you there, didn't it? Yeah. I about the pictures and the diagrams. Okay, if you uh, use water, um, ice, and steam, that's modalism, right? If you, when you're talking about the Trinity. Yeah, yeah. So the il an illustration of the Trinity, um, you get this a lot. You know that water is one thing; it's H two O, but c it can exist in uh, liquid form, solid form, or uh, gas form. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if that helps you kind of get your mind around. 
a, a oneness of nature that can also be radically different in expression. Um, there's a little glimpse of something there. But as you point out, I think it's a perfect illustration of modalism, right? Uh, right, like first you, you start with a block of ice, let's say it's an iceberg, and then you float it to the tropics and it melts and then it goes into the water cycle. You know, it's a three, uh, three things that happen serially. Now I always have a physicist in the audience who will talk about triple point and, and the possibility of, the, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, you could do that. You could have a kind of a simultaneous existence of, uh, of the three forms of water, but you've still got three forms of water, three modes of water's existence. Um, and the other thing, triple points, is a really complex thing to try to understand for non-physicists. And so then we end up thinking a lot about water when we were supposed to be thinking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. So the illustrations are either really simple and give you one little glimpse, or they're incredibly complex. Like there are psychological images of the Trinity that are fascinating, that have given rise to whole theories of uh, personality development and psychotherapy. They're really interesting in themselves, and the more complex and elaborate they get, the less they are about God, right? And so the whole point here is any use of illustrations is make sure they're harnessed, you know what you're doing when you use them, and you're trying to bring them back to the understanding of what God has revealed. Yeah. Here's one over here. Yeah. yeah. He says that he does not know the hour or the time when um, these things will happen. Only the Father knows. So would you say that, you know, that there are things that the Father could hide from his Son and being the same being, but how, how does that work? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'm really tempted to punt to two weeks from now when I do Christology. Uh, <laughs> Um, um, because, uh, though there's father-son language there, and it is the father and the son we're talking about, it's the son incarnate. And so there's some kind of a distinction we're going to need to make between the eternal son in his unity of being with the father and the spirit and the particular mission and conditions of the incarnation. Um, I mean, I could say a few more things about that, but I kind of want my Christological framework in place. But the short answer is the... Uh, ignorance, the ignorance, to use a hard word here, um, that the incarnate Son has about the time of the second coming must somehow be a condition of the incarnation. Yeah? Which then we have to go in and sort out, like, well, then are there two different minds in the incarnate one? There can't be two different persons in there. Uh, so we know some right answers we want to hit, and it's a question of how to do that. But yeah. So in, in general, I, I don't think that that goes to the actual, to their status in, in the Trinity. I think it's a condition of the incarnation that should be thought through that way. Yeah, it's a great question there. So another one right there. Yeah, hey, um, you referenced uh, instances. We have the, the scriptures for where the Trinity was in evidence. We use those three. And yeah. you mentioned you, you're coming up with your Bible with the uh, red, red triangles. <laughs> I was just wondering how many you've, um, you've actually found so that, you know, tonight when I'm reading my Bible, I can track them all down. <laughs> maybe just, you know, Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe even into tomorrow. I don't know how many there are. But yeah. Do you have any count? Uh, no, I don't have a count. That's an interesting question. Like how many um, verses are there in the Bible um, that demonstrate the Trinity? Well, um, so not to get too Socratic here, but it kind of depends on what you mean by demonstrating the Trinity. Um, if you're looking for triads, you know, threefold formulations of some kind. There are several dozen really interesting passages in the New Testament, I, somewhere around 50 or 60, I would say. Um, uh, they take different forms in Paul, um, where he tends to talk about God, the Lord, and the Spirit. That tends to be his language. Um, in John, in John's Gospel, for the first 14 chapters, you have a lot of Father, Son, Father, and the, uh, yeah, Father and Son kind of language, and very little Holy Spirit until about chapter 14, when he really then sort of comes on like gangbusters. Um, so that, then you have to decide, do I only count where I get actually three, or given the literary structure of John, would the Father, Son stuff in the first part also count, if you're saying it's in the same book where the Spirit's going to be added to it? So that's a judgment call, how you want to count that. Um, and then the other thing is, if you think about that diagram and the affirmations contained in that uh, Trinitarian diagram, each one of those is a claim, the Father is God, which does have scriptural witness. 
So you could attach a bunch of Bible verses to each of those claims. The Father is God. The Father is not the Son. Anywhere the Father and Son are in relation to each other, that's a verse. You know, it's weird to say it proves the Father is not the Son. Um, it proves that the Father loves the Son, and then logically that entails that they're not the same uh, person. So if you, if you treat it that way and start piling Bible verses on every one of those claims, you get a ton of proof, you know, that the Son is not the Spirit and that the Spirit is God, stuff like that. So again, that's a judgment call for how many it would, it would take. But I'll bet in the New Testament, if you're looking for something like a triadic formulation, there's, there's probably 50 or 60 places. They tend not to fit in one verse. Um, you tend to find them in like um, three verse chunks or um, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 is all one sentence in Greek. So, you know, that's about 11 or 12 verses there. And it, the whole thing flows the Father chose us before the foundation of the world, we're redeemed in the blood of Christ and sealed with the Spirit. So you kind of have to think bigger than a verse. Um, yeah, at Galatians 3, the whole logic of the argument, it's not one sentence, but the argument has to do with um, justification by the Father because of the Son in the Spirit. Actually, Paul says, hey, Galatians, you have this idea for how to go on and be made perfect, um, you know, through legal obedience. Um, I have three arguments against that, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And he kind of ticks right through them that way. So um, I like my doctrines verse-sized, too. If I believe something, I'd love to have a verse that says it so I could cite it chapter and verse and point to it, and it's right there discreetly packaged. Not all doctrines are going to be able to do that. It's great that we do have a few verses that bring it all together, but really the doctrine of the Trinity is an invitation to go bigger than a verse and say, this is the whole meaning of all of Scripture. And again, where my heart is, is I actually think, this is the whole meaning of all of Scripture, but I also want to make sure to put the bottom rungs on the ladder so everyone can climb there for themselves. I spoke at a conference in Louisville a couple weeks ago on the Trinity, and someone asked um, one of the other speakers, what's your biblical proof for this thing you just claimed? And he said, the entirety of sacred Scripture. And I thought, that is cool. Right? I mean, that guy's, that guy's um, Welsh, and so he's got this great accent, and he's in his 60s, and so he can kind of get away, and he wrote a big 500-page book, so he can kind of get away with it. But every time someone asks me something like that, I think, what I want to say is the entirety of sacred scripture, <laughs> which is true but not helpful. Yeah. Uh, Marsha here had a question about what would be some central uh, Old Testament verses that prove the Trinity, mm, at good. least discuss the Trinity. Yeah, so the Old Testament, um, in the nature of the case, the Old Testament, which um, one of my best friends is an Old Testament scholar, and he calls it most of the Bible, right? <laughs> like, like what we call the Old Testament, he calls most of the Bible. So it's kind of important. Um, uh, in the nature of the case, since it's looking forward to the time of fulfillment, you're not going to get as clear a revelation of the Trinity for a couple of reasons. So it's all looking forward. For another thing, we know that God is a competent revealer, and it, it's, it's awkward to talk about the Trinity as revealed in the Old Testament, because without the light of the New Testament, it's hard to say that it's actually stated or put forward or promulgated there. Um, the Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield back in the 1900, uh, yeah, 19th century said, the Old Testament is like a room richly furnished but dimly lit. Everything's in there, but the lights aren't on. And so when we come to find out that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we don't have to move a bunch more furniture into the Old Testament. We just have to turn on the light of the new covenant, and we can begin to see things really there, right? So once that's the case, you can look back and, and point to really strange phenomena in the Old Testament. The fact that the Messiah is going to come and there's also a promise that the Lord himself will enter his temple. So like I'm expecting the Lord himself to come to his temple and the Messiah, the son of David, to come to his temple. Well, that's going to work best if the Messiah is divine, but you don't get a lot of verses that put that whole argument together for you. And this divine Messiah is going to be, Messiah means the anointed one, so he's going to be full of the Spirit. He's going to bring the fullness of the Spirit, which is also something we're looking for in this time of fulfillment, that the Spirit will be poured out. And so it turns out all that kind of comes together. But again, that's the whole, that's the whole of sacred scripture kind of an answer, right? Um, some of the odd passages you can go to in the Old Testament, and most books on the Trinity will start here. They'll say, let's do the doctrine of the Trinity. First case, biblical case, you know, like first the Bible, then church history, then Christian life. 
Um, first part of the Bible, Old Testament. So a lot of books on the Trinity will start with Genesis 1-1 and say the word for God here is Elohim. Elohim is a plural word in Hebrew. That im ending makes it plural. So it's a plural word, gods, but you don't translate it gods. That would be crazy, especially because it takes a singular verb. Elohim made, you know, not um, they make, but he, it made um, the, the heavens and the earth. So it's a that's cool, isn't it? It's a plural word that takes a singular verb. I'm feeling Trinitarian. Yeah. And then, and then when this um, God character begins speaking in Genesis, he says, let us make man in our image. And then he makes man and woman, male and female. So there's this relational thing that this plural word that takes singular verbs makes in his image. And you think, ah, I'm feeling very, very Trinitarian now. I think all that excitement is really justified if you're walking around in the Old Testament with the light of the New Testament on. But I don't want to give the impression that a reasonable person without the New Testament could come to a Trinitarian conclusion from the Old Testament. So I think it's there, but I actually don't like to talk about the Trinity as revealed in the Old Testament. Um, I like to talk about it as presupposed, or well, we, already, we already kind of went from John 1 to Genesis 1 and said, if what we learned in Jesus is true, we need to reread the whole Old Testament in light of Jesus now, right? But um, I actually don't want to give the impression that God was trying to reveal his threefoldness or triunity in the Old Testament, because I think that God is a very good communicator, a very competent revealer, and I don't think that this set of texts makes known the triunity of God without some help. Yeah. All right, uh, it's just after four, so I need to let you guys go. I can hang around and answer more questions. And if you bought a copy of Deep Things of God for the course, I'd be glad to sign it for you if you want my signature in your book. Let me close this in prayer before I turn you loose. Father, thank you for this time we've had together, Lord. Uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for sending the Son and the Holy Spirit to bring about our salvation and bring us to you. Uh, Father, this has been a wonderful time together to think about the things that you have made known. But Lord, it was a short time, and um, we've got entire Christian lives and uh, the life of the mind as we seek to seek greater understanding of you. So I ask that as you have undertaken to be our teacher, not just to send teachers, but to come yourself and lead us into truth through the Holy Spirit, Lord, I ask that you would take charge of supervise and superintend everything that's been said here, everything that's been heard here, every line of thoughts that, that has been started. Lord, would you take anything that's false or misspoken or might start someone down the wrong trail, just take it and shake it loose and let it fall, not like you need my permission or our permission, Lord, but just be sovereign over uh, the things that are going on in our minds. Let those things fall away and not, not find anywhere to start. But Lord, anything that has been said here uh, that will lead people further into your truth, Lord, will you undertake to drive that further into our hearts and minds so that it could take root and grow deep and bear fruit and bring forth obedience and knowledge of you? We ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.